Folks, when Shannon assigned me, thank you, Shannon, yes. uh, to take the lead on Furlan Getty, I almost said, I don't think so, because uh, I did not know a thing about him, uh, except what everybody knows as part of the folklore associated with American literature, that he was uh, a, a fellow traveler, at least, with the beat poets in the mid, mid in the fifties, and that he what operated out of San Francisco. And then I taught this poem, constantly risking absurdity, for virtually every year for fifty years. So uh, I, I've always admired the poem. I had no idea how it fit in with the rest of his work, really, though. So. I've, I've got a set of comments that I'm going to try to keep brief so that we can get to the poems. But one of the things I've discovered is that there's a lot to say about him. I work more in preparing him than I have probably since my the first course I prepared in Introduction to Poetry. Or I worked in the same way and read... Uh, <laughs> What Barry Selesky's book, Ferlin Getty, The Artist in His Time, which was extremely informative. Wow. Not really a powerfully written book, but Ferlin Getty's life is so compelling that it, it's sustained. Anyway, uh, I want to start by reading you a passage from the book. And this is uh, Paul Carroll. I'll tell you in a minute who he, you may know who he is, but I didn't know. Mm. Uh, this is Paul Carroll. <laughs> it, he, he introduced Ferlin Getty at a reading and he was the publisher, Paul Carroll of the Chicago Review, among other things back. And so here's Carroll describing, and it's a somewhat lengthy passage, but I think it's worth it. Lawrence came to read for Big Table in October 59. I, find, I found an old theatrical hall in the loop on Randolph Street, rented it. It was the first time I ever saw native beatniks in their own habitat with the black <laughs> turtleneck sweaters, the black dungarees, the sandals, even though it was October, clutching icons of Zen paperbacks. And they had all come to hear the prophet reading. <laughs> And it was an enormous crowd, oh, several hundred, which at the time was a tremendous crowd for a poetry reading. And I couldn't resist teasing him. He's introducing Perlin Getty just a little bit. I was inspired by the intensity and the evangelical quality of the beatniks. I said, Lawrence had a most interesting background. He was raised by the family that founded Sarah Lawrence College, and he was a football and basketball player. In World War II, he was a lieutenant commander in the United States Navy. He holds a doctorate from the University of Paris, a PhD in complet. At that point, several beatniks fainted, and I could not resist. I pr proceeded on. I said he, I was, he was an employee of Time Magazine for a while, and he subsequently became a very successful and honest businessman in San Francisco. And he tells me with good cheer that he has made enough money so he can buy a house for himself and his family on Potrero Hill. More beatniks fainted. And I said he married the young woman who is here with him tonight, Kirby Smith. I love this detail. Who was a descendant of the last Confederate general to surrender in the Civil War. And in addition to being a successful businessman with his bookstore, City Lights, and his publishing firm, City Light Books, He's also a very nice guy. You see, <laughs> you see, none of these things were supposed to be. Then I turned the microphone over to Lawrence, and he said, everything Paul said is unfortunately true. He gave a <laughs> terrific reading. Uh, oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah, this book contains a lot of passages of that kind. That's a wonderful appreciation of who Ferlin Getty was. One What's the name of the book? Question. Pardon? What's the name it's, of the book? Sorry to interrupt. Oh, sorry. Right. It's Barry Barry Selesky, S-I-L-E-S-K-Y. 
Torlin Yeti, the artist in his time, and I think it's around 1990 it was published. Mm. I will be happy to give this copy to the first <laughs> requester. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to read a couple more passages from it, but uh, one, the, the large question that you inevitably encounter with him is, uh, what, what was the quality of his own poetry? And then did he become a, re a somewhat renowned poet because he was affiliated with the beatniks and uh, the beat generation poets? Or is there, uh, uh, like other poets we've discussed, real quality in his poetry? And I think even Ferlin Getty's friends, I don't know if many of them would say that he is a major poet. I think virtually everyone would agree that he's a very important poet and that his poetry is, I believe, better than we would, than has been recognized. And it, I think for a lot of reasons that we'll discuss. And his poetry has been sufficiently analyzed by important poets that I think um, at least historically we can identify what have been regarded as the real strengths and then the lesser qualities, although I don't think there are many of them. Um, he produced an enormous body of work. He's a poet, a novelist, a painter, a playwright, a literary and art critic, and all of his work in those genres and media have been really respected and even admired. Uh, I've not never seen a play of his uh, advertised, but his plays are produced kind of regularly. Uh, so he was a force in mid uh, 20th century America and especially in poetry. He, the bookstore he founded in the 50s supported and really promoted the work of some poets whom he assisted in be, becoming recognized. And of course, uh, <clears throat> Allen Ginsberg's Howl is probably the most well-known, but also Gregory Corso. Uh, Kenneth, Kenneth Repsroth had a reputation of his own, uh, but others. And uh, he was very instrumental in founding what's become historically known as the San Francisco Renaissance. I want to read you another passage because I thought this captured something about Ferlinghetti. And, and after this, I, I think we can get to just a couple more thoughts. Uh, Froling Getty was trying to decide what he was going to do with his life. He had this degree in journalism. And he, he thought he wanted to write for newspapers. And so he wrote reviews of events that he attended and then sent them in and got no compensation for them. And he attended a reading by Dylan Thomas when Dylan Thomas was conducting his tours of America. And so it goes like this. Uh, the, this is the account. In June 1952, he sent a review of poet and storyteller Dylan Thomas's second uh, San Francisco visit to Counterpoint, a literary arts magazine, which also paid nothing. Thomas had come with his wife, Caitlin, and easily lived up to his reputation everywhere he stopped, carousing until all hours, battling sometimes publicly with his wife, relentlessly drinking himself across America. A year and a half later on his fourth tour, he would die in New York after another long night of drinking, his American mistress standing vigil while his wife had to be restrained by a straitjacket. <clears throat> His appearance in San Francisco during that second tour was portentous. In his review, Ferlin Getty noted the tone, and this is Ferlin Getty. The poetry he read at the San Francisco Museum of Art constituted, on the whole, one long meditation on dying, including his own ceremony after fire ray, a poem, and his poem beginning, do not go gentle into that good night, rage, rage against the dying of the light. To the young writer, Thomas and his performance were striking. And this is Ferlinghetti again. His reading voice was strange and wild, Ferlinghetti wrote. 
and in a review of Thomas's In Country Sleep that appeared in the Chronicle in March, his praise was unqualified. This is for Linguetti. There is nothing like Dylan Thomas in poetry today. There is a wholeness, a harmony, a radiance about everything he has written, which sets him apart. I just thought for a review by a, a young poet and reviewer that the language and the, the exaltation in, was wonderful. So uh, just a couple more th thoughts. He, Froland gave, Getty gave a lot of readings throughout the world, throughout his career. And there are a number of claims that he has been read and uh, probably heard by more listeners and readers across the planet than any other living American poet. Uh, and all, that's also because he, he knew many languages. Uh, there's a question about whether Ferlinghetti himself was a beat poet and uh, part of the, the beat crowd. He himself, I believe, would say that he was not. And primarily, even though he served in World War II, he was near Pearl Harbor when that event happened. And I'm sorry, he was, he was at the landing at D-Day. Uh, and he was also in Japan a week after and saw Nagasaki a week after the bomb had been dropped. But I think he would say that he did not suffer the disillusionment that has become characteristic, the word that's characterized the beat generation. And that he remained engaged in life and although he, he rebelled against much of what was happening in America, it was through, he was totally engaged and he didn't simply st step away or um, dismiss it. So, uh, next time I'll read some of what uh, he said about poetry, but I'd like us to have some discussion about poems first. Anyone else have thoughts? You've all been reading stuff that Moon sent out and that the article in the Times, which the Seattle Times, which I thought was a very good article summing up his career. I'm done. <laughs> um, I have one thing to, to share. Uh, I think, uh, you know, you were asking earlier um, at the introduction, uh, using the words um, important poets or good poets. Um, and then now we're at the end, you asked is uh, somewhere in the middle, of, you know, was he really a, a true beat poet? Uh, and he was definitely a successful poet, but um, this week I've been thinking about Charles Bukowski and the two of them lived pretty much in the same time and they met a few times, of course, um, and spoke together a few times. And I was thinking uh, if you were gonna have two exact opposites of personalities and, and styles, I think those two would be <laughs> yin and yang of each other <laughs> they would be complete opposites uh but you know uh what Farron get what Farron getty had was he had social skills and he wasn't afraid to talk in public uh bukowski was horribly afraid it very had horrible stage fright and you know i have to say here so here's a poet who is progressive he has talent he has social skills. He can. He's not afraid of public interaction, and he that enabled him to bring in more success uh, and to reach more people. Potentially, you, a person could say. I think uh, those are great observations, Shannon. I, you're right. They're antipoles. Uh, Ferlin Getty really liked people. And, and there were a number, the, the, beat, the beat poets, Ginsburg and Corso especially, he, he kind of objected to their lifestyle. And 
he was old, older than them, more staid, more part of the establishment and the establishment values. Uh, and there were people that he really didn't like very much. He didn't like Gregory Corso. Gregory Corso, by the way, is a fascinating figure for me because in my first year of teaching when I was 20 years old at the University of Buffalo, he also had a teaching assistantship at Buffalo. I was there to get a master's degree. He was there to sell his correspondence with James Joyce to Lockwood <laughs> Library. <laughs> so anyway, I'm a name dropper. Uh, but he yeah. didn't like Corso very much. And then he lived with him for a while and spent a lot of time with him and discovered things that he really liked about him. And I think that was characteristic of the, the way he dealt with people, even, even people whose lifestyle and values didn't coincide much with his. Right. Well, and if people like you, they'll reach out to you and say, oh, hey, you know, let's have this person be a part of this thing. And they know what to expect from you. You're not going to, uh, you know, get drunk on stage and have a fight with your wife and stuff like that. You're kind of reliable. And it, well, it opens more doors. You might become, uh, your reputation, I guess, is, uh, uh, you might have a spicy reputation by doing the drinking, but you really get more opportunity by being behaved. <laughs> well behaved. You're saying I'm done talking, but. One of the things that recurs, uh, Ginsburg and Corso and others would say again and again that when they were short on cash, Berlin Getty was extremely generous with advances and would provide people money and gave a, a lot of money away to help people uh, in, during his life. So is there a poem you all would like to look at? I will suggest the first one I am waiting because I yeah. we looked some, but if if someone wants to go at a shorter one or a preferred, I'm, that's I, fine. I was I was going to suggest I am waiting. I think that's a good starter poem. Okay, it's a long poem, and we've in the past read the poem. Do we want to read this? Mm. Yeah, I think we should read it to get the, it gives us still the flavor of his writing, even though it's long. <clears throat> I'd like to read it. Go ahead. Yes. I will tell you ahead that one of the things that Kenneth Rexroth said that uh, about Furlong Getty's poetry is, it's a strange comment, but I think a really accurate uh, comment is one of, one of his finest qualities as a poet is his management of tone. It's the most challenging element in poetry, Rex Ross says, for a poet to master. And so as I read through the poem, I think this is a good example of a very long poem in which he sustains a tone, okay, an attitude in the poem. So I am waiting. I am waiting for my case to come up and I am waiting for a rebirth of wonder. And I'm waiting for someone to really discover America and well. And I am waiting for the discovery of a new symbolic Western frontier. And I am waiting for the American Eagle to really spread its wings, straighten up and fly right. And I am waiting for the age of anxiety to drop dead. And I am waiting for the war to be fought which will make the world safe for anarchy. And I am waiting for the final withering away of all governments. And I am perpetually waiting a rebirth of wonder. I am waiting for the second coming and I am waiting for a religious revival to sweep through the state of Arizona. And I am waiting for the grapes of wrath to be stored and I am waiting for them to prove. I know the next line, but I gotta <laughs> make my fingers work here, folks. God. And I'm waiting for them to prove that God is really American. And I am waiting to see God on television piped in the church altars that only they can find the right channel to tune in on. And I'm waiting for the last supper to be served again with a strange new appetizer 
and I am perpetually awaiting a rebirth of wonder. I am waiting for my number to be called, and I am waiting for the Salvation Army to take over, and I am waiting for the meek to be blessed and inherit the earth without taxes, and I am waiting for forests and animals to reclaim the earth as theirs, and I am waiting for a way to be devised to destroy all nationalisms without killing anybody. And I am waiting for linnets and planets to fall like rain. And I am waiting for lovers and weepers to lie down together again in a new rebirth of wonder. And I am waiting for the great divide to be crossed. And I am anxiously waiting for the secret of eternal life to be discovered by an obscure general practitioner. And I am waiting for the storms of life to be over, and I am waiting to set sail for happiness. And I am waiting for a reconstructed Mayflower to reach America with its picture story and TV rights sold in advance to the natives. And I am waiting for the lost music to sound again in the lost continent in a new rebirth of wonder. I am waiting for the day that maketh all things clear, and I am waiting retribution for what America did to Tom Sawyer. And I am waiting for Alice in Wonderland to retransmit me to the total dream, her total dream of innocence. And I am waiting for child Roland to come into the darkest tower. And I am waiting for Aphrodite to grow live arms at a final disarmament conference in a new rebirth of wonder. I am waiting to get some intimations of immortality by recollecting my early childhood. And I am waiting for the green mornings to come again. Youth stum green fields come back again, and I am waiting for some strains of unpremeditated art to shake my typewriter, and I am waiting to write the great indelible poem, and I am waiting for the last long careless rapture, and I am perpetually waiting for the fleeing lovers on the Grecian urn to catch each other up at last and embrace, and I am awaiting perpetually and forever a renaissance of wonder. When I first read this poem, because I haven't read it in, in years, I immediately thought of um, of um, Brian, Brian Doyle, because his essays and his words are all about wonder. And this is such a major theme repeated throughout Ferlinghetti's poem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's also a wonderment to me that he shows his own wonder by putting such a such a disparate combination of ideas together that you wouldn't necessarily link in in every every stanza. So I love this poem. I liked it more each time I read it. And mm -hmm. such a patient exploration of each area in in the course of the poem you could show it to people who weren't familiar with it and they'd tell you that it was written in the last couple of years <laughs> yeah great comment mm -hmm. uh, anyone else well, i i we you were mentioning rex roth about tone and i'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about that if we agree that he manages tone well and how you would how you would decipher how you would determine that tone i have mm -hmm. to think more about what tone is well i it, this is probably an interesting comparison but i think i've said when we've had some of our preliminary exchanges that I really like Brian Williams delivery on uh, what it what's the news and, and MSNBC and I like Rachel but Rachel inevitably turns into a rant mm -hmm. and one yeah. of the things that I really like about the control in this poem is that there's irony throughout but it doesn't get savage in its tongue. It's a series of recognitions mm. about the conditions of American life, but it's not bitter. It's, it's just, I am waiting, you know? Uh, 
I'm waiting for these good things to happen. And I think the totality of the I am waiting and the it's not just repetition, but reinforcement is that it, it's a poem that's expressive of so much hope. It's not a bitter poem, mm. at least as I read it. And I think that's careful management of tone, that it, it doesn't break down. <clears throat> that, I, think does that help I think it's, I think it's also uh, saved from bitterness by his end line all the time that he's waiting for a rebirth of wonder. Yeah. Wonder to me is such a not bitter word. And in contrast to the really dire things that he is itemizing in his poem, pretty, pretty drastically bad things, but he doesn't succumb to uh, bitterness or wrath or, or uh, Rachel's rant. <laughs> Does he keep the tone uh, by having a using that repetition? Uh, the uh, in a sense, he, it's almost a planned pattern, uh, and there's no punctuation. It's 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 one running sentence without any punctuation. But he uses his line breaks for uh, pauses and space. Um, the and I am waiting is always on a line by itself. Um, then the subject, uh, the subject, um, like for example, um, the I am waiting by itself. And then there's the subject, uh, for example, the American Eagle, and then what he wants it to do, what he's waiting for it to do. And that is almost always one or two lines of description, uh, really spread its wings, straighten up and fly right. I am waiting, the age of anxiety to drop dead. So that's just, the, the age of anxiety is the, is the thing and he wants it to drop dead. And so he repeats that. And then the, if, you, um, if, you, if you read it, the reader's naturally gonna put that tone along with it because he's doing the same, his thought pattern is the same from topic to topic. Does that help with the tone? Yeah, that line you read uh, referred to, Shannon, uh, waiting for the American Eagle to spread its wings and straighten up and fly right. I think one of the things characteristic of his poetry is the way, one, he, he, he likes to use what he calls the language of the street and not academic language. And he works in illusions, but also cliches. And two of them there, that he really gets power from. Uh, straighten up and fly right. Wonderful irony in, in the use of that cliche. I was, I was going to raise that particular line. Uh, Linda and I are in a writing critique group and we're always calling each other on using cliches. Yes. Yeah. And, and rightfully so. Usually it's because we're being too lazy to think of something better to say. <laughs> I loved his the American Eagle to straighten up and fly right. That was, to me, absolutely perfect to use that old trope there. But then he will he will throw in something like uh, Aphrodite and Chilled Ro Roland. I don't know if that's how you pronounce that, which are classical well, references. Mm -hmm. yeah. But mm -hmm. it, it felt really natural. Well, and he's so widely read, you wonder if you catch all the illusions. Child mm -hmm. Roland, you all may know, Browning has a poem called Child Roland to the Dark Tower Came. And it's it. simply about fulfilling honorably the pledge. Uh, it ends with that line, tell them that Child Roland to the Dark Tower Came. The reference to Wordsworth's intimations of immortality uh, one of the great odes in the language. And he just works it in as part of the pattern of the poem. You notice this poem, folks, uh, is straight edged. It doesn't move across the page. Mm -hmm. he, he talks about his attempt to write poetry. Well, first of all, I'll read a passage from the, about this next week. But he wants to write oral poetry. 
He believes that the academic treatment of poetry has taken the life out of it. And he wants to write a poetry without pages, just poetry to be read and uh, delivered through resonant voices. And so he doesn't want the arrangement on the page to detract uh, and call attention to itself. There's so much conscious organization in the poem and, you know, the rhythms of the lines as you read them out loud. I liked it more and more every time I read it. I like the way he stuck in uh, a reference to himself. I am waiting for some strains of unpremeditated art to shake my typewriter. Yes. And I am waiting to write the great indelible poem. I just think that's, I just think that's masterful. Yeah. And honest. It, it, yeah, it's honest. It's not self-conscious. It's just a desire that he has, and he does it so well. And I love the phrase to shake my typewriter. <laughs> Unpremeditated art, like it's just going to splash in upon him. I'm going to wait for that too. Yeah, I thought I, when I read that, oh, this is of this poem. <clears throat> yeah. For for all that all of us have read about Nazism. Just those two lines, a way to be devised to destroy all nationalisms without killing anybody. <laughs> I mean, you can't, you can't get it more succinct than that. Yeah. Like yeah. what you said earlier, Ron, um, how he didn't write it in a savage tongue. I wrote that down. Um, it's some, it's, he does put it in a way that you can read the poem over and over again, and you the poem continues to grow with um, each reading that you have of it because you find something else um, in it. And I, I like it that it's wondering and it's hopeful. Um, it makes me think of too what Amanda Gorman said in the inauguration poem when she said that we're not broken, we're just unfinished. I mean, it's just a different way to frame it so that we can, um, so that it energizes you rather than zap your energy. Now that we've said all this, and for me, one of the astonishing things that Selesky claims in his book on Ferlinghetti is that Ferlinghetti would write his poems and do virtually no revision. Oh. It's just astonishing to me to think that he wrote mm. this thing and this is how it fell out of the typewriter. <laughs> it's just mm. Uh, along with uh, the other poems. Uh, That's amazing. Do you think he must have had like some notes or he must have had something. It didn't just fall out of his brain. Maybe it did. Came to him. You know, he, he writes so prolifically, there wouldn't be that much time left for revision. <laughs> um, so... Um, and I'd just like to throw in one of my favorite sections or lines was, um, I am waiting for the Last Supper to be served again with a strange new appetizer. <laughs> and yeah. I am perpetually awaiting a rebirth of wonder. Yeah. Gives me the sense that, yes, while he's waiting, he's keeping his mind very, very busy, so he's not bitter. Yes, waiting is not passive in, in this at all. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. this poem feels really energetic, just long strides of phrases. You can't, you can't quit reading. You just sort of have to gallop. I thought that, Linda. I thought, and that's why I, one of the reasons I wanted to read it, I think there's a cumulative energy in the poem that just builds. Yeah. And, then, and then the poem ends in a renaissance of wonder. That's just a great ending. Yeah, not just a rebirth, but a renaissance. A renaissance. Bigger than a rebirth. Yeah. I was struck by your saying, that he didn't uh, he didn't edit and remembering 
so many of us learned more about Mozart from watching the movie Amadeus than we had ever before. But that that sense that they talk about that the music poured through Mozart onto the keyboard or onto the page, that he was a vessel for for that music moving through. So if we can believe that that's true, why could not that be true for Ferenghetti uh, with his poetry? Well, I would wager that most of us who write at, at least a few times have felt the sense that we were vessels, that there were words pouring through us and we don't know where they came from, but they were right. Always. Yeah. This oh, poem, yeah. I believe, Ooh. is from his first volume of poetry, which has sold hundreds of thousands, millions of copies across the world. Uh, a Coney Island of the Mind, mm. a line he gets from uh, Henry Miller's, one of Henry Miller's novels. <clears throat> and and I might mention I think this I and the... And the next poem are both, I think, from that. The other, the rest of the poems, the other five, besides constantly risking absurdity, uh, are from his book, uh, How to Paint Sunlight. And as a, as a poet and a painter, Ferlinghetti was very interested in issues related to light and capturing them in both media. And so that's something to keep in mind. And they're almost all those five poems about light. And Linda, you particularly like the one about the San Francisco light. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. The changing light. Yes, I love that one. Okay. Hey, Linda, you're going to read The Changing Light? Yes. The Changing Light. The changing light at San Francisco is none of your East Coast light, none of your pearly light of Paris. The light of San Francisco is a sea light, an island light, and the light of fog blanketing the hills, drifting in at night through the Golden Gate to lie in the city at dawn. And then the halcyon late mornings after the fog burns off and the sun paints white houses with the sea light of Greece with sharp, clean shadows making the town look like it had just been painted. But the wind comes up at four o'clock, sweeping the hills, and then the veil of light of early evening, and then another scrim when the new night fog floats in, and in that veil of light, the city drifts, anchorless upon the ocean. Yay, San Francisco. Yeah. That's beautiful. I think it captures the light of San Francisco. And here his painter's eye is really in evidence. I just I thought exactly the same phrase at the same moment, that it's the <laughs> painter's eye. The mm -hmm. light of fog, that's a painter. Oh, that's a painter. And, and so is pearly light of Paris. Isn't that Paris? Yeah. Not that I've been there so much and understand Paris, but I have been there. Mm -hmm. What do you all think about the structure of this poem? It, it, it moves like light moves. Ron, I'm curious, um, was, he, was this his signature style or did other people do this? Um, and then also, what is it called? <laughs> We want to come back to Lynn's question, but yeah. he he wanted to capture on page the associated associational thinking, and not just write where uh, sentences or even verses uh, kind of contain the thoughts. It was associative, and uh, it's interesting. He had a conversation with pa Pablo Neruda. At one point, uh, they were, I think, reading together, but they, Neruda didn't really speak English and he didn't speak Spanish. So they, they talked in French, which was their common language. And Neruda <laughs> provided him with a description that Ferlinghetti really prized, that he was not a beat poet, but he was an open poet. And I, 
there's been a lot written to suggest that this style of lines floating across the page capture somewhat his openness and hmm. city, city language, language of the streets, that it's not all academic codified uh, and so on. That's the best answer I can give. <coughs> I think it works. Again, I, I didn't realize how much, I mean, I'm gonna give myself away here. One of the things I've admired about constantly uh, risking absurdity is the way that the lines move like the ac acrobats. And it's a kind of balancing act through the poem. I had no idea how characteristic it was of his poetry. It's interesting that he throws in the, 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 the elongated word halcyon, and it doesn't seem pretentious, even though most of the, of the language in this poem is more simple language. Yeah. Well, and I think it also speaks to um, the themes, um, means, you know, calm and peaceful and tranquil. But it's also a reference, isn't it, to the kingfisher in the myth? Yes. Of the kingfisher. So um, it has a resonance in one word. And nostalgia is built into the concept. Lynn, did you want to say something about your thoughts about the structure of it? No, I just think that it was unusual and I wanted to hear what people thought about it. To me, it, it looks like how the poem feels to me. It looks like the, the quiet swirl of fog. Uh, I think the line breaks uh, resonate with the passing light it, through time as we go through the poem. So he gives us a sea light, an island light, and the light of fog blanketing the hills, drifting in at night. So there's through the golden gate to lie on the city at dawn. So it's painterly and time and space within each line. And after the fog burns off, and the sun paints with white houses, et cetera. So I feel like there's a connection there with line break and time passing mm -hmm. and the light. I, I think this is a really wonderful example of his management of tone. You know, the, the poem starts out by him rejecting the notion, don't, don't bother comparing the light of San Francisco with East Coast or Paris. Right. Uh, the changing light at San Francisco is none of, none of your East Coast light, none of your pearly <laughs> light of Paris. Mm. And then it evolves and in just into this appreciation of what is unique so that by the end of the poem, it really ends in a celebration. And then the veil of light of early leaving, evening, and then another scrim when the new night fog floats in and in that veil of light, the city drifts, anchorless upon the ocean. This is probably going to be an odd thing to say. And I don't know if I can justify it. This poem seems to, to me to radiate the geography of San Francisco if it didn't have all the smooth roads up and down the hills and around the city. It's um, sort of a, a jagged city. <coughs> and I think the way the lines, the lines move across the page reminds me of the way the city is laid out, not laid out, but defined by the water and its borders. I, I think I probably want to feel San Francisco in this poem in crazy ways because I love San Francisco and I like to extract as much possibility from it as I can. In one interview, 
Perlin Getty was asked the question about the development of the San Francisco Renaissance and how it all got plotted out and everything. And he just kind of dismissed the question with a laugh. And he said, hell, we're all carpetbaggers from the East Coast, including me. And he said, we just all arrived at the same time. It was just spontaneous. Mm -hmm. uh, but it became his city. Yeah. I haven't spent as much time in San Francisco as Linda has, but I've been there enough to have uh, a deep emotional feel about the city. And to me, this describes the days that I've had. It describes the fog in and out. And, uh, I'm, I'm wondering something that can't be answered. I'm wondering if someone who had never been to San Francisco, who, I don't know, sitting in Kansas and had never been there, I wonder how they how they would picture from San Francisco from having read this poem. I think they go to San Francisco and say, "Ah, oh, now I get it." <laughs> uh, yeah, that's possible. The first time I went to San Francisco and think remember thinking immediately, there's a unique culture here. Mm -hmm. It was the feeling of going to Montreal to. Uh, New Orleans, there's there's just a total new world there. Yeah. To I me, the jaggedness of the poem and the talking about fog is also metaphorical for San Francisco in the sense that you're you're walking along the street in a hugely expensive area where every little apartment is millions of dollars. And all of a sudden, there are not a few homeless people like we see here, but the streets are packed with them. And you're walking through people sleeping on the sidewalk and so forth. To me, and it, that was so j jarring. And um, then all of a sudden, you're back where everything is swanky. And, and so the city itself has such contradictions that it, it deserves a jagged poem. <laughs> I would like to us to look at the end lines, the end words, for he has a very subtle rhyme scheme going, at least I hear it. I love the word scrim as he uses it floats in. I hearing a sort of an echo of ends rhymes. Uh, lights or scroats, uh, floats in drifts ocean. To me, that helps ground the poem in some of its mastery. Yeah. Yeah, I love the word scrim too. That seemed just <laughs> right. Well, a series of I sounds, the city drifts has almost that I rhyme for me. Mm -hmm. uh, that. I tried to talk about last time. Amory, I bet you're ready for that that uh, treatise on rhyme that we're going to do. <laughs> yeah. The, the two different versions of the word veil, I always think something like that's a risk taking in a poem. Oh, the veil yeah. Of light. He uses the word paint or painted a couple of times. And if I were in my critique group, I'd say, oh, you shouldn't have, you know, the, that reproduction. But this is that using the same words, but well, well works here. I'd like to read another before um, the end of our uh, second hour. I'd like to read another uh, jagged poem. I don't know what we call them, the uh, um, where and see if it also works with that because he uses that style maybe natural history which is uh has nothing to do with san francisco <laughs> well so shannon are you going to read natural history uh that, I don't, let's see is that what you were thinking about well yeah i just uh um also, uh, Ron, what's what's the proper word to use for a poem that's written where the lines are broken up like this? What's what do you call it? A broken up poem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, I'm, glad, I'm, glad, I'm glad that uh, the I would nobody... call it irregular in its line in its 
line length and uh, placement. I think I've heard someone say waterfall palm, but that doesn't make sense either. Yeah, well, good? kind of it does. I like that image. Well, let somebody read natural history. I think that's a good idea. Um, Shannon. Shannon, you want to read it. I'll read it. Okay. All right. Since, uh, <clears throat> natural history. A winter's back is broken. The squirrels are out in Central Park. Where have they been sleeping? In the Museum of Natural History and its great entrance hall, a dinosaur rears up protecting its young 140 million years ago. The hall is thronged with chattering school children. These mammals of all colors pose for pictures under the unpraised Rontos, uh, Barasaurus. He's protecting them too from the raptors of the world. No one knows what color dinosaurs were, nor what happened to them or the young. But here they are today, along with the rest of us. And are we all raptors or advanced humans? As the museum brochures describe us, including President Theodore Roosevelt outside the main entrance, astride a great bronze stallion oxidizing into green, he is flanked by two brave bronze Indians also turning green and all <laughs> the striding forward together into Central Park West into the oncoming traffic of the 21st century. Yeah, that's a fantastic ending. Well, that statue's now been removed, I think, for the, for the reasons that he's suggesting. Uh, the whole, you know, uh, supremacy of the white race with the, with him on the horse and the Indian braves. Yeah. Um, it wasn't the intent, but people found the statue really offensive. I think it's been removed in the last year. So Shannon, what you, what captivated you about this poem? Well, uh, you know, we were talking so much about the San Franciscan uh, poem uh, that the structure of it was um, like what a painter would do and it matches the flow of the city and it matches the mood. Uh, but, you know, he doesn't use this pattern, this broken pattern, he doesn't use it um, uh, you know, he, he uses it actually, excuse me, he uses it a lot. Um, I don't know what the percentage is of his poems written, but I would say at least 30% of his poems have this broken line pattern. And so I'm just trying to wrap my mind around, um, is it effective? I think it breaks, it breaks up the thoughts effectively for me uh, how the fragments of thought are each its own little kernel. Winter's back is broken. The squirrels are out in Central Park. Where have they been sleeping? Uh, I love the question. You know, I see squirrels every day, and I love some, <laughs> it, that someone, a thoughtful person, says, "Where the hell have they been sleeping?" <laughs> and well, the idea yeah. that the dinosaurs that we've always see pictured in this up, up raised to, are protecting their young. It has never occurred to me. I was going to say the question I keep asking, the seagulls are coming back. I was thinking, where have they been? <laughs> where have they been during the winter? Is it a story of natural and unnatural history by the time we get to the end? Uh -huh. hmm. oh, or is it just the progression of history? Betty, are, are you meaning unnatural by not nature or? 
Uh, yes, and exactly not nature, but we're striding forward together into oncoming traffic of the 21st century. Yeah, progress. Is that natural or unnatural progress? That's my question. Or uh, is that his, what is he thinking about that, I guess? Do you find that invitation to wonder that in this poem? I, I think the answer to that is both. It, it is both unnatural in that um, the people and noise and roads and all of that is not natural. But it is natural and is that this is this is the this is the path that we've taken from the dinosaur to all of the people into leading their way into the, the traffic. We have well, it's done out of control. It is the movement, is, but is it natural movement? And it's out of control, and we're not managing it well. That's very true. In danger That's of being that. raptors. That's what we bring yeah. to the show. Yeah. But here's the, I'm going to derail the conversation a little bit, but here's, here's the painter's eye again. These mammals of all colors, no one knows what colored dinosaurs were nor what happened to them. Why is he focusing on colors? I love that because he still has a sense of wonder um, underneath all of this negative thinking about what's happening in the natural, unnatural world. Is our history oxidizing and turning green? Oh, that's profound. You mm -hmm. sound like a poet. Yeah. Hmm. Well, the oxidizing is natural. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. So is entropy more beautiful? <laughs> Are the parentheses distracting? No, they didn't. The jagged lines are distracting in this poem to me, but I didn't object to the parentheses. I would have read it more easily if it were all lined up on the left edge, I think. I'm not, I can see why he did it, but I, I think it's interruptive of the, of the flow. Yeah, I, I, I have to it. wonder if it's effective. I guess my take is I don't have a problem with it. <laughs> I, because it's so, it becomes so regular, it, you, you wonder what was his intent. I mean, it certainly becomes an issue for me. What did he think he gained by having the lines float this way? Mm -hmm. uh, That's my question. When I first read, uh, you know, the line, the, the hall is thronged with chattering school children these mammals of all colors. I was thinking before I read on that the mammals he was talking about were the school children, <laughs> mammals of all children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, they are. Is, that is who he's talking about, isn't it? Yep, I these think mammal, so. These ma mammals of all colors <laughs> pose for pictures. Yeah, I guess it is. Yeah, the okay. dinosaurs were mammals, I don't think. Because he raises the question later, are we, are, are we uh, raptors or advanced humans? You know, what are these little creatures? But yeah, I think that's the kids having their pictures taken under the big dinosaur. Yeah. Well, while we're mull mulling the, this question about the lines, he was strongly influenced early on, great admirer of William Collis Williams and HD. And I think his poetry is highly influenced by the imagists. And he has some powerful images throughout all his poems. The hall is thronged with chattering school children. These mammals of all colors pose for pictures. 
he's protecting them too. Uh, it always looks like the anim the statues or the the bones, the skeletons of the dinosaurs are so aggressive, and I've never thought of them as being protective. Mm -hmm. But it's a wonderful image that he captures with the children underneath it being protected. And the pedestrians in New York are like those children uh, as they walk under the statues of Theodore and the Indians. <laughs> are we being protected? They're heading <laughs> into oncoming traffic. <laughs> They're striding into oncoming traffic. I mean, what a wonderful image for contemporary American society. Yeah. So is his title natural history? Is that irony or is he really, is that really natural history? I wish he'd lived to 102 so we could get some of these questions answered. <laughs> <laughs> but if he had, we might not have been talking about him. Well, that's true. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I, I really wish I'd gone to City Lights more. I really wish I'd sought him out when I lived in San Francisco. There's, I have some, I wish I'd studied his poetry more, gone to his readings, mm. I'm full of regret. Well, you won't have to wish that you were, weren't in the poetry club. <laughs> <laughs> With a bunch of smart people who are enjoying his poems. <laughs> it was not easy to select poems. I wanted a cluster from that book that deals with light. Because uh, we haven't we haven't done something of that kind, just looked at a motif in a, a cluster of poems by somebody. During, during the break, Linda and I were being curious about what Mike would um, would have us do in terms of a structure for looking at poetry. So maybe maybe we'll want to do that deliberately. Um, with whatever poet we pick next. And I want to love to ask what you all think about this line. No one knows what color dinosaurs were, nor what happened to them or their young. The part that I'm curious about is, don't we know what happened to them and to their young? And is he not implying that they that we might become artifacts in the natural museum at some time oh dear mm -hmm. right who knows where evolution will take i i, I think you know, i think it, we're hearing though betty that the answer is probably no uh, because we're destroying the world too fast. But we're what not, did, what did, we're going to evolve into something else because we're, we're killing <clears throat> our world. What did Ferengeti think? Is that what he's warning us? I thought that that comment about us not knowing what color dinosaurs were is a kind of transition from the, the school children are kind of marked by the very lively colors underneath the dinosaur. And then, you know, we don't know what colored dinosaurs are, but here we all are. You know, it certainly a comment about the limits of human knowledge. You're right, Betty, we think we do know what happened to them, but uh, we don't know exactly, there's a lot of, um, information missing about why the dinosaurs disappeared. It's interesting that he has children there because we don't know what's going to happen to them given what's going on. So that makes that those lines interesting. Well, perhaps in our evolution, we are still children. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, all the things that captivate us about the human condition, the, the chatter and movement and color of children together. And, you know, 
what are they going to become? What's going to become of them? It, and we've got Theodore Roosevelt, for whom a statue was raised with two Indian braves moving forward into the future. Uh, and I, I think the intent of the sculpture and uh, of the museum was to suggest that he was a champion, of course, of the Native Americans. <laughs>